Well, guess what we're up to? We're always up to something. We're always up to something. <laughs> Actually, right now I thought it might be fun if we go look for a gas log for the fireplace. Well, we need to. It's cold. It's cold. It <laughs> snowed last night, yeah. for crying out loud. Yeah. So, uh, But the, that has nothing to do with the show. The show, we're still at the Narrow Gauge Convention, of course. And uh, this week, we're going up to the top of Pike's Peak. Wow. Isn't that neat? That is. It's, it's high. It's way up there. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can see everything from yeah. up there. Including Salt Lake. It's, yeah, you can see all the way. I swear, you yeah. can see deep into Kansas, and that is not an exaggeration. No. It's just really neat. And there's a cogwheel train that goes up there and uh, started with steam. And it's amazing history. And the whole area has amazing history. This is one of the funnest things at the whole convention and it really had nothing to do with the convention, it was just us out screwing around. So check this out, we found it. The Pikes Peak and Manitou Cogwheel Railroad. Well, I know this looks like we're in Switzerland, but we're just here in Colorado. It looks like Switzerland. This is a cogwheel railway that was built up Pikes Peak using technology that was developed in Switzerland by Dr. Roman Apt, a Swiss railway engineer in 1885. Instead of relying on the adhesive uh, force of the steel wheels on the steel rails, a cogwheel railroad is driven by a rack which runs up the center of the track which engages with a cog or a great big gear. In this case, there's two rows of teeth and two gears, uh, just a little redundancy there for safety purposes. That also helps spread out the wear and tear on the equipment. You can see the gears here, they're really quite large, and there's one of these gear sets on every driven axle. The only thing holding the gear in contact with the rack is the weight of the train. On some cogwheel systems, they've got a mechanism to keep it from hopping over the teeth. It's locked down. But in this case, it's just held in place by good old gravity. Switches and points are kind of exotic on a rack railroad. You'll notice that the points look perfectly normal, but right at the points, the two different racks separate from each other, one going up each route. As soon as there's adequate space, the second rack simply picks up again and engages with the gear again. This all works out fine until you get about halfway to the frog, and at that point you've got to have a giant moving section here to realign the rack. So as the points move, so the rails and rack move at this location, about a foot in each direction. The remainder of the switch is perfectly normal, if you can call this normal, just a regular rail frog. The trains they're running now are these really modern diesel electric units. They're actually quite quiet. I would have thought that the gear mechanism would make a lot of noise, but they're really quite quiet. The large blisters on the roof contain resistors. These things are equipped with some really massive dynamic brakes, which makes a good deal of sense. Coming down the hill, that's what they need is just brake. The railroad has always employed some pretty exotic braking systems out of necessity. All of the control systems are a little exotic. Notice that the throttle and brakes are run by a steering wheel, like a regular truck steering wheel. I found that quite exotic and weird. These larger two-car trains hold over 200 people, and in the busy summer months, they have several of them scheduled to go up the mountain every day. The smaller single-car trains like this one hold right around 100 people. So there's a lot of people that can go up the mountain every day during the summer. In the winter, they only send one train a day up the hill. Demand just isn't there. Well, we keep talking about going to Switzerland and Europe. I think we ought to take off. Yeah, we should. <laughs> This is so far as close as we've gotten. 
But the train station here, and for that matter, the whole of Manitou Springs, is this really interesting fusion between German, Swiss, and good old American Old West. I love the old station here. It really feels like a wonderful Old West train station, and yet it has this strange Swiss adornment going on, which is just really fun. There's seven different types of rack and pinion systems used on railways throughout the world. The apt system that they're using here at Pikes Peak is by far and away the most popular. Many of the design engineers here are Swiss. That helps explain the Swiss look to the whole thing. It makes sense that the Swiss developed these systems. Uh, any kind of railroad in Switzerland would have to climb the sheer side of a mountain in order to function. The railroad opened in 1889 with steam locomotives. Before that, people used to travel up here all the time just to take in the view, but it took two days to get up here by horse or horse and buggy, so it was not for the faint of heart. So these steam trains became quite popular with people, a much nicer way to get to the summit. Needless to say, these are some pretty exotic and specialized locomotives. It takes a lot of power to climb a steep grade like this, so while these things are very small, they're also incredibly powerful. They're a type of locomotive called a Vulcan. There's actually two cylinders here, a small one and a large one. High pressure is fed to the small cylinder. The low pressure exhaust from that cylinder feeds the upper larger cylinder to generate just incredible horsepower. For the downhill trip, these cylinders are filled with water and the water functions as a brake to slow the locomotive. Notice also that the connecting rod is not connected directly to the wheels as on a normal locomotive, but rather to a bell crank which reduces the throw of the cylinder to the very small wheels and very large rack gear. This also creates an enormous amount of torque, almost like a geared locomotive. The boiler is also mounted to the frame at an angle to keep it level on the trip up and down the hill. The railroad is eight miles long. For the first four miles, you're in good old Colorado pine trees. It's very scenic, very beautiful, pretty much what you would expect to find in the Colorado Rockies. But at the midway point, everything changes. You rise above the tree line and there's nothing alive here by the time you reach the top. It's like visiting another planet. There is literally no life form at the top of this mountain other than the people who came up on the train. For safety purposes, the locomotive isn't actually coupled to the car. There's just a push bar here. The car has its own manual brakes and in an emergency, the car can be stopped, allowing the locomotive to simply roll away from the car. The summit is 14,115 feet above sea level, making this by far the highest railway in North America. But for those people who wanted to get just a little higher, they added this observation tower at the summit. The railroad has always had a perfect safety record, but in spite of that fact, when I see these old train crews, I have to admire them for their courage. In 1925, a man named Spencer Penrose bought the railroad, and he had the notion to modernize it. There were no diesel electrics made for rack rails, so he built his own. An experimental unit was constructed in this, the roundhouse, where we had dinner the other night. Uh, the Colorado Midland Roundhouse, then the Midland Terminal Roundhouse. The thing's just down the road, half a mile or so. So they decided to borrow the facility and build a diesel electric in here. 
1964, they added to their fleet by buying these units from the Swiss Locomotive Works. By then, there were just readily available commercial units being made in Switzerland. These state-of-the-art, very modern two-car trains were added in 1989. On this railroad, when they announce, this is the end of the line, this is as far as we go, you hope they really mean it. You would not want to exceed the end of track here. Uh, the Colorado Prairie is two miles below you here. You feel more like you're in an airplane, not a train. The view from the summit is spectacular. You can actually see very clearly the curvature of the earth. In 1893, Catherine Lee Bates came up here on a wagon and was so inspired by this view, on the two-day trip back down, she started jotting down notes, which years later became America the Beautiful. The railroad starts out at the base of the mountain in Manitou Springs. Manitou Springs is part of Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs was founded in 1871 by Civil War General William Jackson Palmer. He originally called it Little London as he was trying to attract British tourists and he really loved English architecture. This is the home he built for himself there, which he called Glen Eyre, which does demonstrate his fascination with British architecture. But what he was best known for was building the Denver and Rio Grande. This is Rio Grande Locomotive 491, uh, which was the subject of last week's show at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Well, New London certainly was popular with tourists, even though it soon became known as Colorado Springs and this area known as Manitou Springs. But it still very much has its original European flavor. Manitou Springs is sandwiched between two tall mountains, one of which is Pikes Peak, and because it's a very narrow canyon, the entire town has grown up right along the stream. But while it has a very European flair to it, it is still, after all, a 19th century American resort town and feels very much like a 19th century resort town. It is in some ways reminiscent of Coney Island or even the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. Even back in the 19th century, it was well known for its coin-operated arcade devices the coin-operated devices have certainly changed a lot over the years, but the arcades are still full of coin devices and other midway games. In 1925, a man by the name of Spencer Penrose decided to add another major attraction to the area and built this funicular. A funicular is an incline railway towed by cables and this was in operation until the 1990s, when it was destroyed in a flood. The funicular railway has become a very popular and very challenging hiking trail. You need to be in very good health to attempt this. It's very challenging. Actually, a thousand years before General Palmer ever set eyes on the area, there were quite a few people already living here. The cliffs are full of caves, and I guess this had attracted some of the Native Americans, but later it attracted the tourists as well. The complex of caves known as the Cave of the Winds became a very, very popular tourist attraction. 
One of the mountain ridges here is just riddled with miles and miles of caves. And unlike some cave systems, this is practically in downtown Manitou Springs. They've got several different tours that you can take through the caves. But one of the most significant cave systems here is a series of man-made caves a couple of mountains over under Cheyenne Mountain known as the Cheyenne Mountain Complex. In the 1960s, it was determined that the United States needed an absolutely destruction-proof command and control center from which to launch all of their nuclear missiles. It took six years to build the facility which came online in 1967. From here, NORAD could monitor the entire global situation looking for weapons that had been launched at the United States, as well as being able to control all of the nuclear missiles located in the continental United States. A good deal of mythology sprung up around the place, and it soon became a symbol of the Cold War. This section was faithfully recreated for the film War Games in 1983. These blast doors are said to be able to withstand a direct hit by a 30 megaton device. The facility was pretty much put into retirement in 2006, but these days it's been somewhat rejuvenated. It seems there may yet be a need for a facility like this. The railroad was open for the narrow gauge convention of 1996 and I went over and rode the steam train which they had pulled out of retirement just for the narrow gauge convention. They still have one operating steam locomotive there. They almost never run it, but they did bring it out of retirement for the narrow gauge convention. It was really amazing to see one of these old cogwheel steam locomotives actually operating. They also had another locomotive on static display. Number five here doesn't operate, but they do have it in the shops there along with the operational engine number four, which they only operate to the midpoint at four miles up. There used to be a water tank there, but it is no longer there, and without water, that's as high up on the hill as they can go with the steam locomotive. And they do have just one of the original passenger cars, which were pushed up the mountain by the steam locomotives. Of the original six steam locomotives, four survive. Number one here is on display at the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden, Colorado. Number two is on display in the park in Manitou. Number three was unfortunately destroyed in a wreck on the mountain. And number four, the operational engine, which is occasionally run. It was last run when this picture was taken in 2016. And of course, number five, the non-operational steam engine, which is also here in the shops and has been put on public display from time to time. It's interesting to note that the railroad has saved at least one example of every piece of equipment that ever ran on this railroad. <laughs> You have a great toy. Oh, it is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, 
Well, I know a lot of people did not venture out from Denver all the way down to Colorado Springs to see what's going on down here as part of the Narrow Gauge Convention. But that's us. We just like to get out there and screw around a lot. Well, that leaves me gasping for air. <laughs> what a show. Oh, yeah. Wow, what a what a just neat place in general. These incredibly tall mountains with caves under them and yeah. uber secret military facilities under them and a old railroad that goes up to the top of them. They and make just, our mountains look like hills. And and now I just want to go back. I swear, I mean, I, I think we just, you know, yeah. the weather's kind of turned foul, but as soon as next summer comes, I think we're going, we, back. We're going right back. Yes. And uh, I want to play the pinball game, for one thing, at the arcade, so oh, there's, okay. there's that too. There's that. Well, anyway, if, if you haven't been over to the channel, do get on over to the channel. And if you're not a subscriber, you really want to be a subscriber because look how stupid fun this whole this thing is. is. Yeah, this is just really screwing fun. around on a major level. and. You would certainly want to be notified every time we go screw around on such things and, yes. you know, try to get into the secret missile facilities and all this kind of thing. Mostly, of course, it's trains, but yeah. it's screwing but around. It can, can be It can be a missile facility, so it can be anything. Us. So you want to subscribe so you can just find out what in the world we're up to. Mm -hmm. And the easy way to subscribe is to click on the blue button, boink, right here. Blue button says subscribe, makes you a subscriber takes you to the channel. If you don't see it, it's just not supported on your device. It's, but you can go over there and subscribe anyway. Well, we're not sure how you found this movie on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring. And we will see you here again next week with some more screwing around. Actually, we'll see them on Wednesday. That's right. Wednesday. On Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. See you then. Bye-bye.